Let's start with the good news. It looks like Nvidia is lowering the prices of the RTX 4080 and 4090. And this is not rumors, this is not speculation. This is the official Nvidia page selling their cards at lower prices. However, this is not for all regions. Uh, this appears to just be in Europe, and the reasoning is mostly seems to be due to the strengthening of the euro versus the dollar when, uh, compared to when the MSRPs were first set. So I wouldn't necessarily expect all regions to now get this 5% discount, and 5%, I mean, it's something. This is a good thing, but the prices are still really high, especially when you're looking at that 4080. So what about that? We're also getting reports that the 4080 may be getting a more significant price cut across the board by the mid of December, and that this one could be targeting better competition against AMD's 7900 XTX, according to this headline. However, if we dig into this report, this is not officially straight from NVIDIA, unlike the 5% uh, the cut we saw in, Euro uh, in Europe. However, if we read into the sources here, it looks like this is coming from Harukaze5719, who is uh, well-known on the uh, Twitter leaking GPU <laughs> side of things. And he's saying, according to board channels, so Chinese board channels, you know, in the manufacturing chain, some people t tend to get some information about things ahead of time. And he's saying, RTX 4080 will be adjusted price in mid-December. However, the source emphasized price cut isn't afraid of RDNA 3. So in other words, WCCF Tech's headline seems to be claiming exactly the opposite of what their source is claiming because their headline is claiming it's to make it competitive against AMD 7900 XTX, whereas their source is saying it isn't afraid of RDNA 3, but from its own considerations. Now, maybe their considerations are their fear, but anyway, price is appropriately reduced to improve price, price to performance ratio and stimulate sales. Now, actually, I mean, it really does look like NVIDIA's market share is high enough that I think until proven otherwise, they are mainly pricing against themselves. I think the high prices of the 4000 series were designed to continue selling the 3000 series, and it's only as the 3000 series kind of sells out, uh, at the higher end at least, that would be a price competitors to a reduced price 4080 that we'll start to see these um, maybe creep down in price a little bit. However, if, if we did want to change that, people really would have to start buying AMD in significant proportions to actually put pressure on NVIDIA. Currently, we see the 6000 series from AMD selling much lower than the NVIDIA's 3000 series, and yet people continue to buy the NVIDIA GPUs. So unless proven otherwise, I think NVIDIA will continue to kind of just price versus themselves. Anyway, AMD's Ryzen 7000 pricing, now to be clear, we're talking CPUs now, these were lowered and officially it was stated this was kind of a Black Friday holiday deal. However, we're past the week of Cyber Monday. The um, prices have not gone back up. And not only that, but the references to this being a deal and not just a normal price seem to be being removed. So it seems to be, as most people hoped, that this is just becoming a new normal pricing for these CPUs rather than a special uh, reduction just for the holidays. And so, I, I mean, th this is only a good thing. I think these CPU prices make a lot of sense now, and what we'd like to see now is just further cuts to motherboard and DDR5 RAM pricing to start to make these uh, builds even more attractive. Now, how about AMD GPUs and their pricing? Well, well I mean, we know the MSRP for the 7900 XT and XTX um, are $900 and $1,000 respectively. However, how much might the custom cards cost from the add and board partners? Because we saw with N NVIDIA's RTX 4080 that while the $1,200 MSRP was already high, um, people like Asus were willing to go up to like $1,550. They would push the boundary on the 4090 pricing. So, well, what are we seeing here? 
It's looking like according to, I'm getting this from WCCF Tech, but they're getting it from IT Home, sellers in China on popular outlets such as Taobao, I may have pronounced that correctly, have started opening up pre-sale activities for the custom AMD R uh, Radeon RX 7900 XTX and 7900 XT graphics cards. And one seller has listed the prices of the PowerColor 79 series. And um, apparently these are the prices. Now, obviously these are given in RMB, but if we convert to uh, American dollars, we're seeing that the 7900 XT, not XTX, Hellhound is coming in at over 1200 US dollar equivalent. 7900 XT, uh, Hellhound, um, is this like the OC version? Um, these, okay, well anyway, more expensive. I think that's the OC version probably, and this one's probably at stock. Anyway, coming in at close to $1,400 equivalent, and we're seeing the XTX Red Devil coming in at over $1,600. That seems like a lot. But again, this is just translating pricing um, from chi China into the US. These are not MSRPs, so I'm hoping that this doesn't mean that we'll see that pricing on the US market. Anyway, we'll see what happens. Now, speaking of these um, board partner cards for the 7900 XTX and XT, we're starting to see a little more information coming out about these. Asus's tough gaming clock speeds have been officially posted. So uh, I think a lot of people were kind of hoping that AMD had been sandbagging their clock speeds at their announcement and that the cards would actually clock significantly higher. Now that still could be the case, but at least according to the official ASUS post, uh, we're not seeing clock speeds well in excess of what AMD's reference specs were. And so um, the videocards.com article I'm looking at here has helpfully given us some percentages so I don't have to divide things myself. Uh, we're seeing the OC uh, version of the Tough Gaming card um, having an advertised boost clock of 2615 megahertz, which is 4.6% higher than the reference model, and the game clock at 2455, which is 6.7% higher. The default modes at 2565, which is 2.6% higher than reference, and uh, 2395 for the game clock, which is, I think, 4.1% higher than reference. Now, there, that's the XTX version, and now the XT version. I really don't like this naming scheme. Anyway, <laughs> we're seeing a, uh, a boost clock um, of 2535 on the OC mode, 5.6% increase, and 2175 for the game clock, which is an 8.7% increase, and the default mode at a flat 2500, which is 4.1% uh, and 2130 megahertz uh, up to 6.5%. So interesting stuff. Um, and that is uh, official from the ASUS site, not just some kind of rumored specs. Now, speaking of these board partner cards, Power Color, we've already seen them marketing their Red Devils with some interesting marketing language. Well, they're now presenting their Hellhound series. So the, um, let's, let's zoom in. Can, can, can I zoom in? Where's my, where's my zoom button? Zoom, zoom. It's, 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 it's not wanting to zoom more. Anyway, uh, the Hellhound has long been guarding the gaming underworld and is committed to deliver the most reliable gaming experience. Remain simple and sleek. It is never humble in showing its strength when the gamer calls for. The Hellhound of this generation features a second LED color, Amethyst Purple, to provide a different atmosphere to your PC build. Anyway, we are seeing um, this uh, Amethyst Purple coloring scheme, and I always enjoy the uh, marketing language from, from Power Color. I, I think they don't take themselves too seriously by taking themselves too seriously. Anyway, I don't know. The point is we can see the back plates and whatnot, and uh, we'll have to see how these things perform, but it certainly looks like a uh, nice looking card if you ask me, and I do like purple on my graphics cards. Anyway, 
We're also seeing the Sapphire Radeon RX 7900 XTX and 7900 XT reference cards showing up listed on Amazon, but there's no price listing to go along with it. However, we would hope that these official AMD reference designs would be at their, well, official AMD MSRPs of 999 and 899. So we would assume that that is the case. Anyway, there's the, the look at the uh, reference models. I think these reference models actually look quite nice. Um, I, I like the kind of black color scheme and cooler design overall looks pretty good. I'll be excited to see how those things test out cooling wise. Now, speaking of upcoming GPUs, we now see an Italian retailer claiming the GeForce RTX 4070 Ti arrives on January 5th. We have seen other rumors of the 4070 Ti coming in early January, and that this is basically the unlaunched 4080 12 gigabyte renamed as the 4070 Ti. And the most interesting question will be, what will they price it? Because while the name was bad, the pricing was also bad. <laughs> anyway, now this does not appear to just be a placeholder listing because they actually have a massive countdown. <laughs> so it does not seem to just be a, a, a placeholder. Now um, I'm looking at this video cards article, but they're mentioning that this lines up exactly with the release date that WCCF Tech had reported on, which I've reported on in previous videos. Um, and according to that information, it would be unveiled on January 3rd, reviews published on the 4th, and the product actually launched on the 5th. So we'll see what happens. Again, it's probably the 4080 12 gigabyte rebranded as a 4070 Ti. And what I'm mostly interested in is what sort of MSRP gets attached to this thing. Now, AMD's Ryzen 7000 non-X desktop CPUs are apparently coming on uh, the 10th of January, which um, would be nice to see, especially if these come in with, uh, you know, lower price tags and all that. According to this, we're seeing that the 7900 non-X could be just $429, so that is a cut down price, and the 7700 8 core non-X could be 350 and the 7600 non-X, um, uh, let's see, uh, are they giving us the actual price? Looks like coming in at uh, $70 less than the X version at 229 now I think they're comparing here versus their um, the X versions MSRPs, but remember those are actually reduced already as well. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see how these perform and what kind of pricing we get and all of that. But what I'm more interested in personally is the X3D uh, CPUs for the 7000 series. I wanted to wait to build my new test platform for the th X3D chips, um, but I also want to review the 7900 XTX versus a 4090, and I didn't want uh, CPU limitations that didn't have to be there. So I went ahead and got a 7700X, but I do plan on re uh, replacing it with an X3D model. However, it's looking like this time around, the rumor is that it could go up to 16 cores, 12 cores, and 8 cores. Now, um, I'm seeing this from Tom's Hardware, but their source is apparently Quasar Zone, which is a popular South Korean um, uh, site, you know, PC hardware site, all of that. And we're expecting to see this unveiled in January, which would likely go with a CES announcement. Now, it would be really interesting if they actually did offer a 16-core version of the X3D chip because with the um, Ryzen 5000, they had the 5800X3D, which only ever was available as an 8-core chip. So that would be pretty cool. Um, woo, did not mean to swing that around so far. Anyway, um, if I could actually get the X3D chip in 16 cores, then maybe my video editing could also move over to my... Uh, uh, to my gaming test bench as well, we shall see. Now, another thing I was excited for with the new Ryzen uh, 7000 build was um, PCIe Gen 5 SSDs. However, actually finding them available has been a challenge. 
Um, so, and, and then pricing, what are they gonna cost? Well, it's looking like one terabyte is being listed for $400 and two terabytes for $800 and a four te terabyte version for you know an easily affordable $1,600. Well, the nice thing here is at least that's just a times four on the uh, one terabyte to four terabyte and like a times two, so pretty even scaling on the pricing. And this is from a Japanese retailer, Kakaku, uh, probably mispronounced it, but anyway, I tried. And that's listing CFD Gaming's PCIe Gen 5 SSDs. And um, these are the first ones I'm even seeing listed up with prices and for sale anywhere, although maybe I missed something, because I think some of the other ones seem to have been um, kind of delayed as I reported um, about a different branding and controller. Now, Intel's Core i5-13500, there's an engineering sample that has been tested, and this is at uh, Billy Billy, uh, where the uh, review of the engineering sample went up. Now, it's looking like it's going up to 4.8 gigahertz on one core, but again, this is, a, um, this is an engineering sample, but they do have tests versus the Core i5-12500, where they're seeing in single-threaded performance in CPU-Z a 10% uplift, whereas in the multi-threading, it's a 68% uplift. And in Cinebench R23, they're seeing a 6% single-thread uh, uplift and a 60% multi-threading uplift. And versus the uh, 13500 versus the 13400, um, they're seeing a 5% uplift in single thread and 25% in multi thread. And if you're wondering, wow, for a generational uh, uplift, the multi threading seems insane, that's because it's now getting the, the efficiency cores, I believe eight of them, whereas the um, 12500 was kind of awkward because it didn't get any of those efficiency cores. So these will be helping the multi-threading. So if you're looking at using this for any kind of productivity that can leverage lots of cores, that does sound interesting. Now, speaking of Intel, uh, Tom's Hardware has published an interesting article that I don't have time to read all the details into, but it basically Intel giving ideas for how they're going to reach trillion transistor chips. Um, they talk about 2D transistor materials, 3D packaging research, and basically they're just outlining their future technologies that will make their way into chips and apparently trillion transistors by 2023. Sorry, 2023, geez, no, <laughs> by 2030. That's a little bit different. Now, there's a lot of interesting information here, but like I said, due to the, um, you know, I've got a lot of news to talk about today, I will point you to my video description if you're interested. I, and I do link all my sources in the description if you want to delve further into this. Now, another article I found interesting here, I meant to move myself and I'm, I'm, I'm failing guys. Ah, out of the way, okay. Was over at Tech Power Up, they did a image quality and performance review for FSR 2.1, DLSS 2, and DLSS 3 in the uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales update. Now, while I haven't done an image quality comparison in this version of the game, I have been playing this version of the game, and I did feel like the image quality was looking better than in the original Spider-Man Remastered, and Tech Power Up seems to agree with me uh, in their uh, side-by-sides and everything. You can do the still photos at side-by-sides, and they have nice like drop-down menus where you can select um, other you know tests in the same area. However, one thing I'll say is that these temporal upscaling solutions, it's really in motion where you see their deficiencies. So screenshots only show you so much, although uh, they do also have a video posted, which would be interesting to take a look at. So again, I'll refer you to this um, for more of the details. However, um, I, you know, their overall conclusion is that the developers have managed to greatly reduce the shimmering issues on steel objects and the ghosting issues were also greatly reduced. This is compared to the original Spider-Man Remastered. And they say that as a result, DLSS and FSR 2.1 implementations are very close to each other in terms of the overall image quality in this game. So they're feeling like that was an improvement. They also talk about their DLSS frame generation implementation. And I agree with them that the at, at the high frame rates that you're able to play this game at, the input latency isn't really an issue. Um, I do still feel like 
the way Spider-Man moves quickly and his webs shoot out over other objects and everything, I still feel like frame generation, this isn't a game where I'll want to use that in, and it's not the latency, it's the image quality. However, it does help out with CPU limitations to kind of smooth things out where normal DLSS and turning down graphic settings can't, and this game can be very CPU limited. Now, um, also from Tech Power Up, we're seeing it reported that the RTX 4090 has issues with Need for Speed Unbound that can only be fixed with a vBIOS update, except that I think this um, story has been updated since then, and now they're saying that you should update your motherboard's BIOS, and the vBIOS update was going back to something that I'd reported on in uh, a previous video, where certain 4080s and 4090s were getting a firmware update directly from NVIDIA to help um, solve flashing and blinking or black screen issues um, with due to an incompatibility with the motherboard's BIOS. So anyway, I, it seems really weird to me that a game would be running into issues specifically related to those problems where other games aren't. So that, I don't know, something seems really weird about this, but apparently these compatibility issues are directly from EA, and this is what they're claiming. So anyway, I haven't had a chance to test out that game myself and find or verify any of those issues, but thought I'd throw that out there. Now, Google Stadia hardware refunds are apparently rolling out now, so with the cancellation of Stadia, you may want to look into if you are eligible for a refund on your hardware. It's being reported that that um, is up and running. I'm seeing this from 9to5google.com. Now, I already did some separate videos on this, but it was yesterday, not published at my normal times, so if you missed it, Fortnite was updated to Unreal Engine 5.1. This includes supporting Nanite, Lumen, Virtual Shadow Maps, Temporal Super Resolution, and more. Although, Temporal Super Resolution has now replaced DLSS completely, but that's apparently temporary. They say that DLSS will be added back in, they're just verifying it for compatibility and all of that. So for example, the individual trees have around 300,000 polygons. And Nanite allows you to, you know, go into these trees and there's no LOD popping. It just goes smoothly. If you want to check out my videos testing out the RTX 4090, look at my channel. I've also tested out the GTX 1060. So basically I thought, let's take the most powerful GPU I have, test it out, but let's also test out the weakest GPU I still have that's still quite popular, the 1060, and see how it goes. And well, Nanite and Lumen seem to be pretty um, demanding on the old hardware, <laughs> well, on the new hardware too. <laughs> so this is quite demanding. Now the lighting and everything does look very good. I know the game isn't going for photorealism, so some people will say it doesn't look that good. But guys, the lighting and Nanite and everything does look very good. It's just the art style isn't shooting for photorealism here. Now they go into a lot of detail on all of this if you want to look. Uh, we don't have time to read through all of it now. But it's definitely interesting stuff. Now they also talk about the GPU compatibility. Um, and so they're saying they're recommending for Nanite that you have an RTX 2080 or newer or a Radeon RX 5700 or newer. I also tested this on my 6800 XT and on my RTX 3060. Currently those are just on my channel members feed because I didn't want to flood my, my, it's bad in the YouTube algorithm to just flood the channel with too many similar videos that get a low click through rate because people already saw a bunch of them, and anyway, the point is, if you do click the join button down there, there are currently um, a couple more test videos on this uh, if you want to support the channel and get access to those. Those may or may not ever make it to my main channel, just depending on if I feel like they would um, do okay in the YouTube algorithm when I have time to post them. Now, they do talk about um, compatibility at all, for the, for the game, so minimums PC spe specifications to run Nanite. The minimums they're saying is an NVIDIA Maxwell generation card or an AMD GCN generation card. And I was double checking on that. 
Um, which, I, with a Google search, which GPUs are GCN? Because <laughs> I didn't follow this stuff as closely when those uh, first came out, guys. Didn't have the channel. Anyway, AMD's Radeon HD 7000, HD 8000, 200, 300, 400, 500, and Vega series of graphics cards, including the separately released Radeon 7. So it says on selected models in these lineups. So anyway, and then I'm seeing Maxwell GPUs. Uh, in later models of the G4 700 series, uh, but then also used in the 800M series and the 900 series. I remember it mostly from the 900 series. I had a GTX 970. Anyway, so that's the official specs, but as you'll see in my GTX 1060 test, Nanite is brutal on the 1060. In a competitive game, I don't think it makes much sense. But if you take this more as just a performance test for Unreal Engine 5.1 features in general, then I think those frame rates might be more interesting for a single player game. Now we're also seeing Apple could potentially delay its AR headset due to unspecified software related issues. And I don't want to get too far into the details on all of that, but we'll see. I am interested in this AR headset, um, just to see what Apple, uh, what Apple's take on this kind of thing is. And we're also seeing the Callisto Protocol PC patch slightly improving the stuttering of the game. Now this says slightly improving, meaning it does not appear to be completely fixed. Now I'm very interested in this game, but I can't decide if I want to play it now or if I want to wait until more of the fixes are implemented, which is kind of what I'm leaning towards. Now, um, I'm also seeing it reported that the Callisto Protocol future improvements are to be detailed this week with ray traced reflection issues uh, being the ones that are currently being looked into. And then, last thing I'll leave you guys with is Samsung's GDDR7 memory is um, being announced. Now, when we'll see this in a GPU, probably a long time from now, but it's offering 36 gigabit per second bandwidth and is using PAM3 signaling. So what's going on with all of that? Well, PAM3 is pulse amplitude modulation signaling, which is offering 25% better efficiency than NRZ, non-return to zero, which is currently used in GDDR6. So it's looking like it will have better uh, energy efficiency compared to GDDR6 is nice, but it's also going to be a lot faster. Like we said, the bandwidth up to 36 gigabit per second. And for example, the GDDR6 used in um, the RX 6000 lineup is 18 gigabit per second. So like that would be twice as fast. Although things like GDDR6X um, is um, up to 23 gigabit per second. And I think AMD's 7000 series will be having 20 gigabit per second GDDR6. But this does look like a substantial improvement, but I'm not sure when we would actually see this in a GPU. I wouldn't expect it in this generation or anything like that. And I hope all of you have an excellent day.